right, so I did my research on Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, so to give a little overview and a little history of Guillain-Barre syndrome, a uh, French physician named Jean-Baptiste Octave Landry uh, discovered the disease in 1859. Uh, so sometimes it's called Landry's paralysis. But when Guillain Barre and Stroll detailed the condition in 1916, it's more common known as Guillain Barre syndrome. So, what is Guillain Barre syndrome? Guillain Barre syndrome is immune mediated radicular neuropathy, uh, and there's also four subtypes. So, the first subtype is the most common in the United States, and it's acute inflammatory demyelinating uh, polyneuropathy. Um, the second, uh, a little more rare, is called Miller-Fisher syndrome. And then the next one is acute motor axonal neuropathy, um, aka Chinese paralytic illness. And then the last one is acute motor sensory axonal neuropathy. Um, and so like I said with the first one, uh, that's the most common in the United States. The, the last two are more common in places like uh, China, Japan, India, and Mexico. Um, so not a lot seen in the United States. Um, and again, with Miller-Fisher Miller -Fisher syndrome, probably about 5% of people who have Guillain-Barre syndrome have that subtype. So it's an uncommon condition affecting one to two persons out of 100,000. So it is also the most common cause of acute neuromuscular paralysis in the world and it affects sensory and or motor neurons. So depending on which type you have, um, is gonna depend on what, what part of the nerve is affected. So um, the immune system either attacks the myelin sheath or the axons, damaging peripheral nerves. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit more in the next slides, but it's either gonna attack the axon um, or the myelin sheath, which is basically just the insulation around the axon. Um, so with the ones that attack the axon, it's kind of just in between the, uh, the myelin sheath, which is called the node of Ranvier. Um, and so many patients become temporarily paralyzed and therefore hospitalized. Um, some need a mechanical ventilator as a result of weakness in respiratory muscles. So this can be a very uh, dangerous disease, especially when you lose your ability to breathe. And so you, you, you definitely need to be in the hospital and needing that um, external assistance. So the exact cause is unknown, but two-thirds of patients report prior infections. So the most common infections that lead up to Guillain-Barre syndrome are upper respiratory infections and gastrointestinal infections. Um, so we have some triggering, triggering agents here. Um, one of the most accepted is Campylobacter jejuni or C. jejuni. Um, it's, it's a bacteria that causes a lot of gastroenteritis. Um, especially in third world countries. Um, the next one is cytomegalovirus or CMV. Um, there's influenza virus, there's Epstein-Barr virus, um, there's human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, mycoplasma pneumonia, and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and then there's other possible triggers that are kind of debatable. Um, surgery and vaccines, chickenpox, dental infections, and then more commonly in recent years, Zika virus. So the risk or predisposing factors is it affects more men than women on a ratio of 1.25 to 1.5 to 1. Um, and then one source said there's an increase with older age, um, but another article stated that it happens more in the younger um, span of life or in the older. So kind of like in between, there's not as much of a prevalence, but if you're younger or if you're older, then you have a greater chance of, of being diagnosed with the, the disease. Um, so signs and symptoms depends on which subtype you have. Um, Miller-Fisher syndrome presents with ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and areflexia. So typically it'll begin in the eyes. Um, common symptoms for Guillain-Barre syndrome as a whole are progressive ascending symmetrical paresis. Um, you have lameness, you have gait imbalance, you have difficulty walking up stairs. Um, so usually it, it's something that starts low and then works its way up. So a lot of, a lot of patients will report um, 
a loss of sensation, maybe a loss of motor movement in their legs, um, and, and so forth. Uh, paresthesia, um, hypo or areflexia, ataxia, dyspnea, and fatigue. So it can also cause um, difficulty with eye or facial movement, which is going to um, have a lot to do with, and the difficulty with chewing is going to have to do with cranial nerves. And so since those are still part of the peripheral nervous system, um, they're still subject to, to being uh, attacked. Um, dysphagia, um, dysphagia, uh, urinary or fecal incontinence, and tachycardia. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is diagnosed through cerebrospinal fluid analysis or electrodiagnostic testing. Um, with cerebrospinal fluid analysis, they're looking for an increased um, number of proteins in, in the fluid. Um, so if they have an elevated protein level, then that's an indication of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And with electrodiagnostic testing, um, if they have a slower nerve conduction, then that's a, then that's a, a <clears throat> sign of, of having Guillain-Barre syndrome. Okay, so a little bit of the pathogenesis. It's an autoimmune, um, as we said, and uh, the epitopes on the antigens um, are resemble um, something that's infectious, and so so the epitopes on the peripheral nerves resemble epitopes on infectious agents. So the immune system attacks um, erroneously. So they 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 shouldn't, but they do. And so as you can see this picture, you kind of have this end of the antigen that typically pairs up with the paratope on the antibody. Um, so this part right here resembles something as infectious and so the, uh, the immune system just starts attacking it. Um, and again, it either does the myelin sheath or the axons depending on which subtype you have. So here's another picture um, just showing the Campylobacter jejuni. Um, it's, uh, again, this is, this is a triggering agent that's, that's widely accepted among uh, health professionals. Um, the, the other ones, not so much, but definitely see jejuni as one that they believe is a, uh, is a triggering agent. So as you see here, you've got an immune response, the B cells, the T cells, um, you have an antibody production, you have the cross-reactive antibodies, um, and then down here you have the, uh, the AMAN, um, that's the one that's kind of in the, the, the what? the eastern countries um, and so that's going to attack the axons right there in between the myelin sheath and then you have the acute inflammatory demyelating polyneuropathy which is the most common in the United States and that's the one that attacks the myelin sheath and it's going to eat away at that at that insulation. So there is no known cure. Um, treatments do include intravenous, intravenous uh, immunoglobulin therapy uh, which basically suppresses the immune system. You have plasmapheresis, which is plasma exchange. Um, so it's gonna remove certain inflammatory molecules. Um, it's also kind of similar to um, a kidney dialysis. Um, so if you can kind of put those two together, you can kind of understand a little bit of plasmapheresis. Um, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation techniques. Um, so that one was an interesting article that I read, which was basically with people who have um, their diaphragm affected. They can do these these repeated contractions and rhythmic stabilizations. Um, and most people who did these did show uh, an increase in their ability to control their diaphragm and to increase their inspiration and respiration and inspiration expiration. Um, so what is intravenous immunoglobulin therapy? It is a solution of highly purified immunoglobulin G derived from large pools of human plasma that contain antibodies against a broad spectrum of bacterial and viral agents. Okay, so it's, again, it's just something that kind of comes in um, and can suppress the immune system and uh, can also give you some good antibodies. Plasmapheresis, uh, again, it's kind of like the kidney dialysis. It's going to take blood out of the person. It's going to go through it's going to split up the erythrocytes um, uh, and, and the plasma, and it's gonna filter the plasma, and then it's gonna bring it back and put it right back into the, the person's body. So it's filtered and treated. Okay, so it does have a mortality rate. So um, 
about three to eight percent. Um, and there's an aggressive onset. If you have an aggressive onset of symptoms, then you tend to have more severe effects and poor recovery. Most have full or nearly full recovery. Um, and it can be from a few weeks to, to years. Um, it's just, it just depends. Um, many walking independently within three months, so, so that's good. Um, children typically recover faster and better than adults, an average of 50 days to recovery for children. So children can definitely recover faster from this, this disease as opposed to the older adults. Um, and even one study found that in certain children, Guillain-Barre syndrome had an impact on their career and education development. Uh, it also showed an increase in behavioral problems and a, as opposed to a reference group. And then it is, uh, this is just a disease that's still being studied today and continued research will hopefully find a cure. Um, and as future physical therapist assistants, we have the opportunity to, um, to increase their ability to, to utilize the muscles as they recover. So no therapy isn't going to to heal the nerves. That's just something that's gonna happen on their own. But uh, as physical therapists, we, we should be able to help them get back to doing what they were doing before and, and uh, achieving their functional ability. So, and then at the end, some references. And that is it.